Hey everybody, Mike here in the BFH garage and today I'm going to install an ARB air locker into a high pinion Dana 30 housing. ARB air lockers have long been the gold standard for locking differential devices. If you do research, you're gonna see some people say, oh, I don't like my ARB, they leak all the time and things like that. And I think they get a really bad rap because when they're installed correctly, these things are, are very, very reliable. And that is part of the thing. Just like any other component you're gonna install on your vehicle, you need to make sure that it is installed correctly. So if you install your ARB air locker correctly, and let's say you get a break at the seal housing or something like that, uh, yes, it's gonna leak. Just as if you go to install a, uh, let's say an axle seal on your rear axle and it leaks because you installed it correctly, then yes, it's going to leak. So the key is to get it installed correctly, and that's what I'm gonna show you how to do today. So one thing to note about the ARB air lockers, when you look at a normal, open carrier inside of a Dana 30, normally the shims go to the inside of the bearing. When you're dealing with ARB air lockers, the bearings go on first and then the shims go to the outside. That makes it very uh, easy to set up because you're not constantly having to take uh, bearings on and off or even have set up bearings for that matter. And when you go to do final assembly, it's all there and everything goes in nice and easy. Now ARBs are like a lot of other components on your vehicle, they do have wear items. So if you do develop a leak down the road, it's usually something that can be easily replaced. So when you look at the seal housing here, this is what the air comes through and goes into here. There's these little uh, rubber O-rings and these things are, um, they're, they're pretty stout. They'll last a long time, but eventually they can, over time, get nicked up and and they'll eventually leak. It's a wear item. It's really easy to take this locker back out of your differential, replace those O-rings, and put it back in. Another wear item on the ARB, and it's by design, is a clutch gear on the inside. So the clutch gear is designed to fail before any of the other parts of the housing or spider gear components. So if that fails, you pull the clutch gear out, you replace it, and you're back on the road. Okay, so one of the first things I wanna do with this uh, air locker is we need to get the ring gear installed on it. Um, as uh, you've seen in all my other videos, the, you put the ring gear on, it's not gonna seat all the way down because um, the tolerances are so tight. And you don't wanna go around and beat it on with a mallet or a dead blow hammer either because you could potentially leave it cockeyed and not, note, uh, not notice that. So one of the things I do every single time and, uh, and it works like a charm as I take my ring gear, I put it in the oven at uh, 200 degrees for about 20, 25 minutes, come out, and it slides right over the top. The, if you're not familiar, when you add heat to metal, it expands. When you add cold to metal, it contracts. So you can easily put this in the oven, leave it out in the sun sometimes is enough to make this work. One thing you don't wanna do though, is take some sort of torch to your ring gear to get that expand because you can damage the ring gear by doing that. So let's get this in the oven. And while that's heating up, we're gonna get the bearings pressed onto the carrier. When you get ready to press your bearings on, get your press all set up. And one of the things uh, a lot of people have recommended on my previous videos is when you're doing the bearings, take some uh, grease, a very light coat of grease and put it on the inside. So that way it presses on easier. I live in a pretty dry climate. I don't have an issue with these going on. They go on pretty good, but the reasoning behind it makes sense. If you ever have to take them back off, you don't want them to get seized on. Um, and all the time I've been doing gears, I've never had an issue with seized uh, bearings, so it's never been a problem for me. So um, near mileage may vary, but it doesn't hurt to do that. Now with the ARB air locker, I'm going to press on the bearing on the seal uh, housing side first because when that gets set, it'll be below this. And I can flip this over and I'm not worried about hurting the bearing. So I'll put this one on first, then I'll flip it over and do the other side. One thing to make sure of when you're doing this is have your bearing oriented the right way. You want that cone facing out. 
So the other bearing we have to press on right away is gonna be the pinion bearing. We wanna make sure that we orient this on the pinion head correctly. That way the race comes up and over. So the problem with this now is if I was to just put this in there and start pressing, you can see how this cage sticks out further than the cone. So again, it's something else you have to back up here with another cone. You could use the one you cut off. I just happen to have a drawer full of them because I do so many of these, but now that'll allow that bearing to spin and not get damaged. So the ring gear's out of the oven, it's ready to get put on. So I wanna get that done before it cools down. So we get ready to do this, I need to add Loctite to all 10 bolts. So now you can see as this comes up, it fits right over that area that it was getting stuck on last time. So I'm gonna get it uh, set right there. Start a couple of these uh, bolts, get it to hold in place. And then what I'll do is I will start the rest of them. Now that I have them all started, I'm going to push the ring gear up, get it centered. And I'm gonna go and tighten two of these. Just so that way they hold everything in place. And one of the things I do, and a lot of people think it's a waste of time, but I mark each bolt with some paint. I have a little paint pen, I just give them the numbers, and then I go through and I torque everything to make sure I get a good star pattern on that. So I'll do that next. All right, now the easy work is done. Now we have to tear the axle apart so we can get everything out of there and figure out what our starting shim stacks and everything are gonna be. And then we could start working on installing this once we get that axle cleaned up. Starting with the teardown. You know, I might as well just go into it right now. Talk about this in every single video that you are looking for marks on your bearing caps that match marks out here on the side of your housing. So if I wipe that off right there, I don't know if you can see that or not, right there there's a letter A. And if I come over to this bearing cap and wipe it off, I should expect to find a letter A somewhere over here. And it's right next to it. So I have a letter A here, a letter A here, and they're both oriented that way, which means when you go to put this bearing cap back on, it needs to go to this side and in that orientation. When you come over to this side and wipe it off, there's a letter A there, there's a letter A there, and it's barely stamped in there, but it is also on the same orientation there. And you need to make sure when you go to put your bearing caps back on that you put them back in that orientation. Now, if you find an axle that doesn't have a letter stamped into it, then what you need to do is take a punch, put one dot over here, one dot on your housing, two dots over here, two dots under your housing, and that will let you know which side they go on, which direction they, they go. Believe it or not, I have seen axle housings that have an X stamped in there. And when you think about an X, you can move it any different way and it can be confusing. So if you're not sure of what you're dealing with, just go ahead and put in your, uh, your, your punch marks and then you'll know exactly what you need to do. Nothing like burnt bearing grease smell. Okay, so with the uh, bearing caps being off, we can now pull the carrier out. But if the carrier is set up properly, 
it, well, okay, so this one pulled straight out, but it's not supposed to do that. That means this thing is worn and jacked up. So let me put this in there and show you another trick. Hang on just a second here. Oh, Murphy's Law. Okay, so that one's back in there now. So for some reason, you can't pull it out easily like that, and you shouldn't be able to. In fact, what I'm gonna tell you is when you go to put your ARB in there, you should not be able to pull that ARB back out. You wanna make sure you have the required amount of preload on those bearings. And what the preload on the side bearings is, you're gonna have shims in between here. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause pressure to go that way and it's gonna make the bearing seat into the race on both sides. And it gives it its, its uh, working spot, I guess for lack of better words. You get the proper amount of preload and then the bearings will operate the way they're supposed to. So if for some reason your differential doesn't come out like it shouldn't, a trick you can do is put a wrench on one of the ring gear bolts, put it down to the housing, and then turn the housing, and you'll notice this walks straight out. So that's one way to do it. Now, it doesn't come all the way out. You're still gonna have to give a little bit of force to pull it out. Um, in this case here, you can see how loose that was. That's just crazy. Now, I'm working on a high pinion axle, so that uh, wrench would have to be down here. On a high, uh, I'm sorry, on a low pinion housing, I would have to put that wrench up here and do it on this side. So just understand that if you can't get it to come out, make sure that you have your wrench on the right side. If you're doing a high pinion housing, it goes to the low side. If you're doing a low pinion housing, it goes to the high side. The other th reason that your carrier might not come out, and I've seen this happen before too, is that you forget to pull your axle shafts out and you start pulling on this and you can't figure out why it's not coming out and then it dawns on you that you didn't pull your axle shafts out. So make sure you have all that stuff prepped. Because this is an open carrier, the bearings are pressed on with the shims underneath the bearing. So in order for me to get a, get a good uh, starting point, I would have to pull these bearings back off to get to the shims to see what it is. In this case, I'm not too terribly concerned. I've done enough of these that I'll get it figured out real quick. But if you need a spot to start, a very good rule of thumb is see what the shim stack is on side to side, write it down, and when you go to reinstall or install your ARB, you can start with that. One uh, note of caution there is when you go to put the carrier back in, check for your backlash as you're doing it because if you have no backlash and you keep trying to beat that carrier in there and there's no backlash and nowhere for the uh, gear to go, then you're gonna have problems. So as you're tapping that in there, click, 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 make sure you have your backlash. So let's pull this out, keep the races to the same side, although this whole thing's going to my junk pile, so no big deal. Take it out, put it right there. So now as we look inside, you can see that this axle is pretty dirty, which is what I would expect. And now we have to go around to the other side to get the pinion out of there. Because I have a handy dandy axle stand that I built, this makes this job a little bit easier for me. I still uh, need to do things exactly the same way you're gonna do this. If you're doing this under your vehicle, this can be a pain in the rear, but this still shows you how to do it. If you're under your vehicle, you're just gonna have to work at it to get it completed. But this axle stand definitely makes things a lot easier for me. So up here, I have the uh, yoke, the pinion yoke. I have to get the pinion yoke nut off in order to get that pinion gear out of there. So I like to use my handy dandy trusty impact wrench, make short work of that. And uh, um, that it just it makes life so much easier. So if you don't have one, consider getting one or using or borrowing or something. Okay, with the pinion yoke nut off, you have to take a punch. You're gonna notice a little hole inside your, uh, your pinion gear there. You take a punch, put it right there, and then you're gonna start tapping with the hammer on the other side. Now, before I go any further with that, you wanna make sure that you have um, a hand in there to catch that pinion gear coming out. If you're gonna throw it away, then it doesn't necessarily matter as much, but the one thing you don't wanna do is have the pinion gear come out and then all of the shims fall over the place, and then you have no idea what your starting point is for your shim stack, so keep that in mind. I'm going to rotate the housing back down. And actually, I'm gonna kind of point it up just a little bit to keep that from happening. And then you guys will see what I'm talking about. 
you'll feel it start to loosen up and that's when you want to be real careful. So I get the washer off the backside, the pinion uh, yoke comes off and now I can pull this pinion gear uh, right out. So as you pull this out here, you're gonna see that you have your tail bearing shims and that's what sets the preload for your tail bearing. And then right here you have a, it's a slinger, but it's also a shim and that's what sets your pinion depth. So we're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna put shims behind the pinion bearing and that will give us our pinion depth. These aren't required usually if they're in there, I'll reinstall it, but it's not absolutely required. They just kind of use it as a, a shim and then to help keep uh, gear oil up on that pinion. Now, if you're worried about gear oil getting up inside and on bearings, think about this for a second. Imagine putting a plug on the other side of this housing, turning it 90 degrees that way, filling it full of gear oil, having your ring gear in there and starting to spin at any type of speed. If you look up at your ceiling, you're gonna find that there's gear oil all over the place. So I don't think it's that critical that you get that in there um, to help keep that in there because it's minimal of what it does. Well, the next portion of this is removing the, the uh, pinion seal. I thought I pushed record, I did not. So this sits in here just like this. You wanna be careful because you have a baffle on the inside that you do want to reuse and keep. So when you look at this right here, this lays in behind the seal and this goes between the seal and your tail bearing. That sits right there. Now you do wanna keep that in there because that will keep that tail bearing uh, lubricated. When you are um, removing a um, pinion seal, as you can see right here, it's just a matter of banging it with a hammer, start folding in your sides. You can put a hole in there, start prying it out. Or if you have a seal puller, put your seal pull in there, pull this thing out. But you're not gonna reuse this thing. This is gonna be absolutely destroyed. So start working it in slowly and then eventually everything comes out and you're good. So next we want to remove the races that are in there. So if you look right here, that's your tail bearing race. And on the other side, inside the housing right there is your inner bearing uh, race. We need to punch those out of there so we can install new races. So if you've never done this before, let me find a, a new race. So if you've never done this before, inside, you're gonna see just a little bit of edge of that race from the backside. So right now I'm gonna knock out the inner, uh, the inner race so right there where my thumb is that's going to be the only part showing so you have to get some sort of punch right on that outside edge you're not going to be able to get it all because it's inside the housing you want to get right on the edge work on a circular pattern until it comes free um, a lot of people tell you to use a brass drift punch for this this part doesn't matter because you're not going to be reusing these uh, races so punch them out of there toss them and you will be good to go just whatever you're using, make sure it's got a good flat edge and that you can catch whatever you need. Now, another thing to keep in mind too is there's probably going to be some shims behind there and even another baffle. Um, there's not much you can do to keep from damaging those, so make sure you have new parts to put in their place. Make sure you're not banging on the actual housing itself. and then it falls right down. So there you go, the race pops right out. And then I've already had this apart once, but this is what's gonna come out when you're all done. So you see this baffle here just uh, gets obliterated. So if you have a new one, use it. If you don't, again, not critical, but if you have a new one, use it. And then here's the shims that went behind that race. Now I need to turn it over and get the outer bearing race knocked out. So same procedure applies. This time you'll be able to see it. And as you can see, I'm gonna put this up close so you can try to get a better look. As you can see, there is barely anything here to tap on. So that's why you have to get something that is flat, has a good 90 degree edge. You're gonna work around in a 90 degree, uh, or I'm sorry, in a uh, circular pattern to get that thing knocked out.
now that we have both races out, this axle is almost ready. The only thing we have to do now is remove the inner seals. Now these seals have a lot of miles on them. They look good, but since you're in here, believe me, replace them. So if you see that orange round gasket looking thing, that is not a gasket at all. If that falls out, you don't have to worry about replacing it. What that is, is that is the sealant that they use when they press in the tubes from the side of the housing. So they, they slather that stuff on, they press in the tubes. That's what comes out the other side. You can take a pick and just pull that out and uh, there is no harm whatsoever. So let me show you what I'm talking about. It is not a seal though. It's just leftover sealant. And as you see, it just kind of comes out like so. And even if there's some still in there when you're done, it's fine, no harm, no foul. But now that it's out of there, you don't have to worry about it. So let's punch those seals out. Easiest way to get these uh, inner seals out, take um, a pipe of some sort, put it in your housing from the exterior. You'll see it comes right through the seal there. So you wanna get just below it, get yourself your BFH, and then you're just gonna tap from the outside. I can't stress enough on cleaning the inside of this axle housing. You wanna make sure you get every bit of gunk, junk, grime, grit, dirt, or anything out of this thing before you start setting up. If you start getting bits of uh, grime back there, it can actually affect your pinion depth because it's getting behind the shim and it will give you a false reading. So make sure you get everything cleaned out really good where your seals go, make sure you get that wiped out. We'll drive in the new seals and we're gonna be good to go. As far as the face of the housing, um, I cannot stand RTV, but an easy way to get that stuff off the face of the housing is uh, first of all, scrape the big parts off with a razor. Oh, say that three times fast. Brass bristle brush and um, you can scrub all that stuff right off. It actually comes off pretty easy. Scrub isn't even the right word. Just work it and all that stuff comes completely off. And then when I go to reseal this with the uh, diff cover on there, I use uh, and absolutely love lube blocker gaskets. They're reusable. You pull the uh, diff cover off, change out your gill, and you just bolt it right back up and it doesn't leak. Those things are absolutely awesome. So uh, let's get started with the install process. Ready to move on to install. So with the locker here, the uh, races go on the bearing like so, and I'm just gonna do that to demonstrate something here. I'm gonna set that upright so you can see this. So the locker will spin like that. Well, we have the rest of this journal here that we need to account for, and that is done via the seal housing. So the seal housing, you put in your um, O-rings there, and that will set there. Now, if you'll notice, there's still a gap in between there, and that is where we set our shim stack. So ARBs come with two master shims that they use, and it's designed for their housing. Goes on like that. You put that on there, that starts filling up that gap. Now, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see it from there or not. There's a little dot right here on top of this journal. And what that is, it lines up with the hole right there, if, you, uh, if you'll notice. When the air comes in from the seal housing, those O-rings sit on either side of that, of that dot. So the, imagine the seal housing being on there and these O-rings being like that. You can still see the hole right there. These O-rings are what provide the seal and force the air into that hole and down in through to your uh, wave spring, your clutch gear, and it locks all that stuff in place. Now, the reason that dots here is they have to drill out the hole to get it to go in there, and then they come back and they fill it back in with either epoxy or, or welded in. I'm not sure exactly what they do for that. But that hole on this side has to be drilled this way and then 90 degree going that way. So that dot right there is nothing more than the um, hole that goes down through the journal where it needs to go. So we need to account for uh, shims in here. So we have the, um, the master shim right here. And as we start needing to move the locker left or right to get our backlash set, 
then you could either add shims in the between these two, or you could subtract shims, but you'll never have less than that master shim. And most of the time, in fact, every time I've ever installed an ARB, there's always been shims in between these two. So they set this master shim um, at, I believe they're at a, a hundred thousandths, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, you know what, since I'm right here, let's just check. Um, correct, they're right at that hundred thousandths. And you'll, you'll add shims in between in order to move this thing further away. At no time will you add so many shims that you'll cover that uh, hole with one of the seals. If you're doing that, then something might be wrong, or you could in fact have a, a larger master shim that will sit outside of the seal housing that goes with the axle. That's common on uh, like Dana 44s, I've done that before. So the, the, the fine tuning of uh, shim setting goes between these two. And if you have a master shim to the outside, that's fine. It's easier to get it in that way. Last thing you want to do is get stuck with a 3,000 uh, thick sh shim right here, trying to get it into a housing. It's, you're not going to have any luck with that. So that's why that is designed that way. And then there is a, another master shim that goes on the outside of the other side of the uh, uh, bearing race right there. And you will take whatever shim stack you need in between here and the race in order to get your carrier to go left or right, and this will be to the outside. Now, if you had a master shim on top of this that went to the outside, in other, word, in other words, a, a shim that came with the housing, it would go to the outside of the ARB master shim. The housing that I have here had no master shim, so this will be the outside shim. Okay, now with that being said, um, I have kind of a luxury here. You're not gonna have that if this is your first time doing it. So when you think of uh, seal housings here, these copper lines bend real easy. You can unroll them, you can bend them whatever which way you want. But the problem is down here, it is brazed into the actual seal housing. And brazing means you have to get this seal housing completely red hot and insert your copper line and then put in your brazing material in there to make that connection. So you just can't go in and put solder on it. It doesn't work that way. So. The, the downside of that is if you've never set these up before and you don't have a lot of experience setting these up, you have to be really careful when you're working with this thing. You have to keep the copper line to the other side of this so when you're sliding this in and out of the housing, you're not gonna beat this up. You don't wanna bend this thing over and crack it there. I've actually cracked one there. My own fault, again, uh, installation error or user error. So it is possible to, um, to damage these while you're doing install. And that is the whole purpose of me sitting here talking to you and trying to help you understand how to do this correctly the first time so that way you can lessen the chance of damage to these things. Now when I talk about a, a, a nicety for me is I can take the one that comes with the ARB and put it over here and I have an old one where the, the seal housing copper line broke off. And you know what, those happen. Um, a guy brought one in, a buddy of mine had one that um, was leaking from a bad install. He had to get a new seal housing, so he let me keep this one and I can use this one now as a setup seal housing, if that makes sense. Let me explain what I'm talking about. So it has the O-rings already installed. I can um, put it on there. And now I don't have to deal with the copper line that is off of that thing. So I can take this thing, put it in and out, not worry about bending that line. So when you see me doing this, you're not gonna have that luxury unless you happen to have one of these laying around, but that is the whole purpose of me using this. So when you see me using this, don't break your copper line off and think that's what you need to do because that's not what you need to do. So speaking of setup parts, um, another thing that uh, we need to do as far as setting up, when you're setting up gears, you have to get uh, your, your pinion depth set correctly. So pinion depth is, um, imagine this being inside the housing right now, your pinion depth is how far in that pinion head goes out or, or, or go, goes in or comes out. So as you can see there, there's going to be room that you can take this thing and put it in or out. And the only way you can do that is by putting shims between the bearing and the pinion head or by putting shims behind the race while it's inside the housing. And I'm gonna show you how to do that here in just a second. So if you have a clamshell puller, you could pull this bearing off every time and keep putting shims behind the pinion head 
and the uh, in between the bearing and the pinion head, and that's fine. But for people who don't uh, have clamshell pullers, nor do they want to go through that much work, the other way to do that is to make what's called a setup race. So when you look at the race that goes with this here, this has to actually get pressed into the housing by using a seal driver kit. So I'm gonna take that off, and I have another one that I've turned into a setup race. So if you'll see here, I have it clearly marked so I don't get it mixed up. And it's Dana 30, and I have the S on it for setup, but this is a brand new Timken uh, race, and it's the exact same thing as this race. And their tolerances are, are very tight, and I feel absolutely comfortable putting in a setup race that's brand new and then taking it back out and putting in my final race for install. So how do you do that? A lot of people are gonna ask that question. You have to sit here and you have to take material off the outside of this race. And you can do that with a, a Dremel, put a sanding drum on a Dremel and you sit there and you slowly work it back and around, back and forth, being consistent as you can, going all the way around this thing until it doesn't need to be pressed into the housing, it will slide in there with a slight tight interference fit, but you should be able to slide it in there and then slide it out. And every time you slide it in and out, you could take a shim, put it behind there, and you could adjust your pinion depth that way. So when I'm all done and I have a good pattern and everything's set the way I want, I will remove the setup race and then install the the uh, new race in its place and that will get driven in with the shims in place because it's not going to come back out again. So that's how you do that. Uh, another thing that I use is a setup tool and you guys have probably heard me talk on my other videos is the pinion nut. So and, and there's a there's a good reason for this. So as you put on this nut here you see how easy this goes on right here? Well when you use a new nut they don't go on that, that easy. Let me uh, show you something here if you can see it. I'm not sure if you can see that, but you're gonna look at the end of that nut and it looks like it's oblong a little bit. And that's only part of the feature of this nut. It's a Stover type nut. So Stover's a brand, but it's a Stover type nut. It looks like an egg shape there. And what it's designed to do is you put it on you have to deform that egg shape into round and it creates a clamping force on it. In addition to that, the threads are pretty darn sharp and they will cut into the other threads and that's what provides that gripping power. So the downside of that is, and I learned that the very first time I set up gears, um, I was taking the original nut, putting it on and off multiple times and it galls up the threads and eventually these threads completely stripped out and I had to buy a whole new gear set. Part of the reason I'm here today to keep you from doing that. So take a Dremel to the inside of the threads, that same sanding drum uh, uh, that I was telling you about, and go around and take off that sharp edge on those threads. I mean, work it quite a bit, get that sharp edge out, and eventually these do wear out as a setup nut, so you can't just keep reusing it hundreds of times. I'll probably get eight or 10 uses out of them, but you wanna take that sharpness off of the threads that way, when you're driving these on, they aren't galling up the threads as you go. Now, another little thing I do to help prevent that from happening is I'll take some gear oil and put it on the threads. And as I drive this on and off, that gear oil helps to lubricate it and allows the, uh, the nut to engage the pinion without destroying it. Now, when I go for final assembly, I'll take some brake clean, get all that gear oil off of there, and then I'll put the uh, final nut on uh, dry. That way it has that gripping force. So um, what else do we have? We have some uh, specialty tools that you're gonna need. Obviously the shop press is one of them that you're aware of. Um, we're gonna need a, inch pounds torque wrench and the whole purpose behind an inch pounds torque wrench is when this thing is inside the housing and your yoke is on the back side there we have to measure the rotational force when this is inside the housing the only way you're going to do that is with an inch pounds torque wrench you can't use a clicker style because a clicker style you get to your torque and it clicks and then you're just there but it, it doesn't get a constant reading of torque so don't think you can go into setting gears by using a clicker style torque wrench you have to get a uh, inch pounds 
either a beam style like this or there's a dial style that will uh, also read. The dial styles are expensive. This here's a beam style. You can buy these online, Amazon, bike shops have them, things like that. And you put the, you have to take a couple fittings to up it to the uh, inch and an eighth nut. And once you have that driven uh, to spec and it feels like you have the right amount of torque, you're gonna take this, put that on there, and it's gonna read in inch pounds. So this is something you're gonna need for this setup. Um, another thing you're gonna need is a micrometer. You could either have an analog or a digital at both. And the whole purpose behind this is to measure shim thickness because you have to measure shims that are gonna go on either side of the um, carrier as well as shims that go behind your race that go inside the housing. You also need to measure shims that are going, going to go, oops, um, that are going to go between this bearing and this little uh, journal edge right here. And that is going to set your, your pinion preload on the backside. And that's the whole point behind the torque wrench here. You add or subtract shims here to make your preload either tighter or looser. And you measure that by rotational force using this torque wrench. We'll get into all that here in just a little bit. I just want to give you a rundown on some of the specialty tools. Um, another one, it's not really specialty, but you want to make sure you have a dead blow hammer. You don't want to use a steel hammer because you'll bend things, you'll break things. The dead blow has the sand in there or the, uh, um, the little pellets, whatever it's going to be. And when you hit something, it doesn't bounce back. It goes in and it stops right there and it all that weight behind it coming forward helps to drive in your carrier or drive uh, in whatever you're going to be using so a dead blow is another uh, tool that you're going to need so with that being all said now we are ready for the install let's get to that and uh, let's get started okay i want you to understand uh one thing about the pinion when i'm talking about preload you have to understand that your tail bearing comes on this side so it's going to look something like this and the way you adjust your preload is by adding shims right there so these little bitty shims here and there's just a random stack these shims will go on right there and then when you put your bearing on and um and you you press it in the rest of the way that bearing will rest up against these shims right here and if you want to decrease the amount of preload then you add shims and what that does it pulls those further apart that way there's uh, not as much uh, preload on there if you want to add preload then you take away shims and what it does it allows the bearing to move in tighter and that will allow for a greater uh, preload so that's the way that works there's no shims that goes behind this race here so that allows us then to go ahead and just press that race in right now and we don't have to uh, deal with it anymore. It's kind of a set it and forget it. There's a fine time to take a peek in there and make absolutely sure that you have every speck of dust out of the backside of where that race goes. It's really important to get that stuff out of there. So you're going to take your race, you're gonna set it right there. You're gonna get a, a bearing driver or a race driver and you're going to drive it in until you hear the ping or you just feel it it's going to feel solid so you have to get that in there the whole way you hear that sounds kind of hollow and you hear how that kind of pinged when it finally seated the whole way so that's in there we don't have to mess around with that anymore if this is your first time setting up gears, you have to understand there's four things that we're concerned with when setting up gears. You have pinion depth, you have pinion preload, you have backlash, and then you have carrier preload. And some of them have to come before the other, although they all um, affect each other. So what I mean by that is the first thing I want to do is establish my pinion depth. But the only way we're going to do that is to put shims in here, start at a random number, or if you have a pinion depth setting tool, but those are expensive. Most, most people don't have those. We're going to start by putting some shims in there. Then when we put in the carrier, we'll get it to the backlash we need, and then we will run a pattern and see where we're at. Now, why don't I need to worry about the pinion preload at that point? Well, that's plain and simple, and that's because I can drive on that nut and get a ballpark
of where I need to be. As long as it's firm, but not over tight, then I know I'm, I'm close enough that I can run a pattern. Where it really matters is at the very end, you wanna make sure your pinion, your pinion preload is absolutely perfect. Um, and as far as carrier bearing uh, preload, yes, you wanna get that in there pretty good too because that affects whether the carrier moves this way or moves this way. And the tighter you get it, the less it'll move. And that does affect your backlash reading. So everything kind of goes in concert with each other. So let's start with pinion depth. Now as stated earlier, I like to use Revolution gears and they have a chart to put in the box and their suggested starting depth is 42 thousandths. I've never seen that even close. Um, I'm usually upwards of, you know, 55 to 75 thousandths. So I'm gonna start with a random 55 thousandths right now. That will give me an idea of where um, I'm gonna be. So I'm gonna take my shims, put them in there, make sure they're set, and then I'm gonna take my setup race and slide it right in over the top. And again, that setup race, since we hone the outside off, slides right in, just like that. One of the things I do with my bearings um, prior to rotating them, I put just a small amount of gear oil. And I mean, just enough to get a really thin coat on there. And the reason being is you don't want to run your bearings dry. So I'll take and just put like a little bit of a drop, a couple drops there. Then I'll, I'll rotate them, make sure they get good and covered. That way we're not running dry bearings. So with my race in there now, what I need to do is install the actual pinion gear. I'm gonna set that there, come to the back side, gonna install the bearing, take my yoke, put it on the back side, start the nut, and then I'm gonna use my impact to, to get it to where I need it to be. Now, if you're gonna use the impact, you gotta be very careful because you can over tighten it and crush your bearing. So when I'm talking about pinion preload, you need to make sure that you aren't over tightening those bearings. You wanna have a, a little bit of resistance, not a ton. And if you can't move it, you've probably gone too far. So as you can see here, I'm able to turn it by hand. It's got a good rotational force there. Okay, one thing you're gonna notice when I put the pinion in is I didn't put that rear baffle and I didn't put the seal on yet. That is a very last step because that thing's gonna be coming in and out so many times that you only wanna do those, uh, those steps once. So now that we have the pinion in there, we need to figure out our carrier preload, or not preload, we need to figure out our shim stacks for our carrier. So I'm gonna put some shims behind the races. We're gonna set it in there and see if it's close. So one of the things you wanna do before you start um, putting things in here is measure out all your shims using those calipers. Put marks on them because you're gonna be going from shim to shim back and forth and it's nice to have the numbers written on them and then you can just go uh, figure out if you need to subtract three thousandths then you can go to a three thousandths inch thinner shim or you can mix and match to get to the number you're looking for. So get that done ahead of time. So now that we have the pinion in there, I, uh, I took and I added some shims in between the seal housing and the race there. I have some shims here and I just did a quick check to make sure that it would be um, snug enough, tight enough for what I need. And uh, we need to get it in there. Now, a word on carrier preload, just so you're understanding what I mean here. I shouldn't be able to just shove, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't be able to push that thing in there nice and easy. It should take some influence with a, a dead blow hammer. And then you know that you're gonna have the correct amount of preload. The other option to this is if you have a, a differential spreader, you put that on there and it moves the differential out. You can only do that up to 15 thousandths of an inch though. And then you could put the carrier in there, release the pressure and go from there. Poor man's way of doing it is to get a dead blow. Should take a, I don't know, six, eight wax, whatever to get that in there. And again, I'm making sure that I still have some backlash. And then you gotta get that in there the rest of the way. One of the little tricks I use, I take a wood block, that way it doesn't 
bend my shims, it doesn't destroy the ARB. I can take that, and you'll hear when it hits home. I know it's there. Actually, that sounds pretty good for backlash, so what I need to do now is check my backlash. When you check backlash, you need to have the bearing caps on, um, finger tight anyway, because that will affect backlash if you don't have it on that way. So make sure I get these oriented correctly. Now, I use my little cheater method here. I have my drill with the clutch set. So what I do is I take and push that there. Make short work of it, and then I know they're at least finger tight. So backlash is the amount of space between the ring gear tooth and the pinion gear tooth. So the pinion gear on the backside comes in from the side. It's that fraction of an inch, a thousandth of an inch space between those teeth. You need that space there so that way lubrication can get in there and lube the gears and everything runs smoothly. So now I need to bring out a special tool that I forgot to tell you about, and that is our dial indicator. And when you look at a dial indicator here, the whole point is you put this plunger on the tooth and is as it moves, you can see that needle move back and forth, and that's going to give us readings for what the backlash is going to be. Now, depending on whether you're working on a high pinion or a low pinion axle, you want to take your reading from the drive side of the tooth. The drive side appears to be flat that way. The coast side goes down at a slight angle. So on a high pinion here, I need to put up on this side. If I was doing a low pinion, this would be clear over here on this side. So adjust accordingly, get it to where you need it and then you're going to get that set. And that's fine, if that's spinning right now, that tells me it's on there. So I'm gonna get it close, set my magnet. Now the very first thing I wanna do is make sure that I don't have the plunger touching the tooth behind it. So that is good there. That's all set, I know I have engagement, so now I can click back and forth. Now if you look right here, you're gonna see that plunger, I'm sorry, the uh, needle move up and down. And that corresponds to that click you're hearing here. Take a closer look. So the click, click, click is the ring gear. When I move it back and forth, it's touching the tooth on one side, touching the tooth on the other side. Now, when you're taking a backlash reading, you do not want your yoke to move at all. So make sure when you do that, the yoke isn't moving also. So let's see what we're at here. So looking at this, now if you want, you can zero this out. I don't even do it anymore because I can do the math in my head, but for the purpose of this, I'm gonna zero it out. So right there, zero, and I come back, and I'm just about eight and a half on backlash, which is almost perfect. Um, backlash spec on, uh, on axle housings is gonna vary uh, depending on the gear manufacturer's recommendations. So in this case here, I'm looking for between five and eight thousandths, although uh, Revolution Gear, Stand by one. Revolution Gear states that the backlash that they're looking for is between six and ten thousandths. So we are definitely in that ballpark. What that is going to allow me to do now is paint up a few of these teeth and run a pattern. And that pattern is going to tell me whether the pinion depth, remember we're trying to get pinion depth right now, it's gonna tell me whether the pinion depth is too shallow or too deep. So if it's too shallow, it's gonna run off the backside of the ring gear. If it's too deep, it's gonna be way in there and it's gonna create problems. And the way you figure that out is to paint teeth, run a pattern, and then interpret that pattern. I'll show you that next. So you wanna take your gear marking compound, I already have some mixed up from the last one, but this stuff usually comes out pretty thick, so you want to thin it out a little bit with some gear oil. If you look here, you can just see that it's, it doesn't drip off there, but it's definitely thin compared to what comes out of that little pack that comes in your uh, master install kit. So I have this thinned out pretty good with some gear oil, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint three teeth, both sides. Make sure you get good coverage. 
And then we want to rotate the pinion gear through the ring gear and that will paint a pattern. So one of the things you need to do is take a gloved hand and provide resistance. And the reason behind that is it makes your gears contact better and it wipes that paint off and gives you a good reading. So you want to make sure that you have some resistance on these gears. I take a drill As you saw, I take a drill and that gives me several rotations through the teeth and that allows me to get a lot done in a short amount of time without having to sit there and manually work everything back and forth. So let's take a look at this pattern real quick. And just as I suspected, this is way too shallow. And the way we can tell that is that it's got that kind of round look going into the uh, root there and it just comes right off the top of the face. So we want this pattern to move more into the face of the tooth, and then when it's set right, you're gonna see a fine little line, kind of like what I just painted there on top of that tooth, that will uh, be indicative of a good pattern. So let's start messing with these shims, get them to where we need, and uh, we'll take another pattern. And just to be perfectly clear on what needs to happen here, because we finally took a pattern, we realized that pinion is too shallow, meaning that it sticks out that uh, side of the differential too far. We need to bring it in this way. And the only way we're gonna do that is to get the pinion out of there, put some more shims behind that race, the setup race that I have in there. That means we need to take the bearing caps off, we need to pull the carrier back out, we need to pull the pinion back out, set those shims, put it back in there, put everything back together, make sure our backlash is right, which means we have to move some shims from this side to this side or vice versa to get our backlash within spec. Then we can finally take another pattern. So now you can see why this is so time consuming and frustrating for a lot of people because it's a lot of work of the differential coming in and out, back in, pinion coming in and out, back in, adjusting all those shim stacks. And we're talking shim stacks um, you're trying to get it dialed in within a thousandth of, a, of an inch. So it is uh, very specific of what we're trying to do here. It takes a lot of work. So putting the carrier back in, listen to the backlash. I can just tell by listening to it that that's too low. And the reason that that has happened, because we pushed the pinion depth in further and it reduced that backlash from last time. So right now we're right on the edge of having zero backlash. So I need to take some shims from this side, move them to this side, and that'll push the ring gear that way. And what that'll do is that'll increase the amount of space between the ring gear and the pinion gear. Now, a word to note here, when I make my adjustments on my pinion depth, I'm not making small adjustments initially. So I knew that that last pattern was really shallow, so I added a full 20 thousandths of an inch, and my intention is to make it too deep. And when I see that it's too deep, then I will have effectively bracketed it. And I know that, hey, this reading here is too shallow, this reading here is too deep, and then I start working them until they get closer and closer together and eventually I'll get it to perfect. So the whole point is, make sure you do too shallow, too deep, then you definitely know that you're in the ballpark of where you need to be. And the best way to do that is to keep track of this stuff on paper. All right, I added the 12 thousands from that side over to that side. You can hear we have backlash. Let's set up the dial indicator. And again, you have to kind of adjust this every time you're doing it. You want to make sure that you're not on the tooth behind it. It's not leaning up against it. It's taking the reading straight off of that tooth. So right now I'm at seven thousandths, which is in spec, which means we could paint the teeth, take another pattern. So when I repaint the teeth, what I do is I wipe off the excess paint that's on the brush and I just repaint the teeth that are there.
that keeps you from making a big old mess. So after adding that uh, 20 thousandths to the pinion depth, I ran that pattern and you can see I'm right in the ballpark, but that's not what I'm looking for. My intent was to add a lot of shim in there in order to drive it too deep so I could establish that deep side of the bracket. Um, I haven't done that yet, so I'm gonna pull this back out. I'm gonna add another 10 thousandths to that pinion depth and make sure that I'm getting too deep then I can start backing it out and, and uh, dialing it in from there. If you look at this, we're pretty darn close. I could probably even you know, get that fine tuned in no time at all, but because I wanna make sure that I'm bracketing, that uh, that way I can make sure I'm in that sweet spot. So if you look at the coast side of this, the coast side of this looks darn near perfect, but because this is a high pinion 30, we want to favor the drive side since that's the side that's going to be doing most of the work. So I'm going to add some uh, shims to the pinion depth. We'll make it too deep and then we'll start fine tuning it. Now that I added the 10 thousandths extra shim in there, you can see clearly how it's too deep now. If you look right now, let me get my pick up here. If you look right here, you see how much paint there is between the pattern and top land of the tooth. That is way too much. We're just looking for that little sliver up top. So now I know that I've effectively bracketed this. I'm going to pull out five thousandths and try it again. And if I need to pull out more than that, then I'll start doing that. But now I know we bracketed it. Now I can start getting this thing dialed in perfectly. As with any change we make on this, I again now have to take everything back apart and start pulling shims out from behind that race. So everything's got to come back out again. I took five thousandths out and as we look here, you can still see we're just a little bit too deep. And if you look deep down in there, you see that harsh line you get in the backside right there. We don't want that harsh line. We want it to be a nice diffuse pattern. So this one's still just a tad bit deep. So when I added that 20 thousandths the first time, that put me darn near perfect. So what I'm gonna try to do now is subtract three thousandths and see if that puts us exactly where we need to be. Again, everything has to come back out. took the pinion depth back to the 20 thousandths, but I opened up the backlash to the high end of the spec. Now again, Revolution shows uh, six to 10. I normally shoot for five to eight, but this is at 10, and I just wanna point something out here. So as you can see, now we have a good looking pattern. We have that thin line I'm looking for uh, right there right at the top, that's perfect. So that's a good looking pattern. And that's centered on the tooth from this side, oh, come on, focus. From this side to that side, that is all centered. So that's a good looking pattern on that side. But let's take a look real quick at the coast side now. So if you look at the coast pattern now, the pattern is good, it's diffuse, but it leans more to this side than it does this side. So just as an experiment, so first of all, this is an acceptable pattern. I could. Uh, um, put that final race in and be done with it, but I'm going to close up the backlash just a little bit and run another pattern and just compare the two and see what happens, just out of curiosity. So I brought the backlash down to eight thousandths, and if you look at that pattern there, I like that a lot more than the other one, and again, we are trying to favor the drive side since this is high pinion, so I'm happy with that. Now let's take a look at the coast side. Now, when you get in there and look at the coast side, we still have a good pattern there. It's still leaning um, to this inside edge right there, but that's still a good pattern, and I'm okay with that. I'm not sure I'm gonna get this any better than what it is, so I'm happy with the setup. Now we have to continue on uh, by getting that pinion, uh, the new uh, race in there, and then get the seal in, get the pinion preload set. We still have to drill the hole for the seal housing, so still a lot of work to do, but at least we have the gears where we want them to be.
Before I start uh, getting ready to drill the hole for the seal housing and all that, I'm gonna go ahead and set the pinion preload. So before I drive that other race in there, um, I just decided to leave what I had in there since it's already in there and then I'll have to do things multiple times. So what I need to do is figure out what shims are gonna go there in order to get the correct preload. So when you look at this pinion gear, these little shims right here, they go right over that and they, uh, they push up against that little shoulder right there. And then that bearing goes on and then what it does, it keeps the bearing either further away and if you take shims away, it lets the bearing get closer and then it tightens up even more. So we are trying to get a pinion preload between 16 and 20 inch pounds and uh, that, that's our magical number, but we have to start somewhere. One of the things you can do is you can measure the old shims to get a good starting point. But if you look here, these are my old shims. They're completely destroyed, bent. I don't even know if I could get a good reading off of it anyway. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the number that I know will be fairly close. You know, it'll get me in the ballpark and then I can dial it in from there. So. I pulled four of these uh, shims out that gives me a starting shim stack of 73, and I'm hoping it's a little bit too loose, and then I can uh, start subtracting stuff until I get to the preload that I'm looking for. One thing you need to be very careful with when you're doing this is when you're tightening that pinion nut to establish preload, you constantly have to be checking to see if it's getting too tight or not. And even though I can do that with an impact, um, if you don't have one or if you're not familiar with it, I mean, do very little increments once it starts tightening up and then you can run your inch pounds torque wrench and see, see if you're there. And if you haven't reached your torque spec for the nut yet, but it starts tightening up too much, then you know that you don't have enough shims in there, back it out, add a shim, and then get it to the point to where it's too loose and then you can kind of creep up on it. But you don't want to just drive your impact wrench home and not realize that you don't have enough shims in there and then all of a sudden crush your bearings and all that. So very delicate process you'll see here as I uh, start putting it together and uh, I'll kind of walk you through it. So in order to do this, I have to get the pinion back in. I have my shims set on there already. You want to make sure that those don't fall off as you're trying to put this in. Put that bearing up there, get your yoke on. We're gonna start driving this until it starts tightening up. And if you can get to your full torque spec before it tightens up, then you know you need to take shims out. Let's just tighten this up and see what we get. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check periodically. You see there's a lot of movement in there still. It's starting to tighten up. So I know my impact wrench will get me there um, and I definitely don't have enough preload on this. So now I need to start taking shims away in order to allow that to get closer, tighten those bearings up to get that preload. So I'm gonna back this off and I'm gonna start pulling shims out. I'll probably pull them out at about five thousandths at a time and we'll go from there. I subtracted five thousandths. See what we get. So you can see that we're starting to get some good preload there. So what I'm gonna do is find my inch pounds torque wrench. So I'm gonna check Right now I'm sitting at about 18, but I'm not at the full pinion nut torque spec. So what I need to do is get my torque wrench along with my pipe wrench and see if I can tighten it up and see where it puts me. So I was pretty close to being the torque spec, so I'm gonna try this again, see where it puts me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tilt this up so you guys can see how this works. 
So in order to check the pinion preload, we need to use an inch pounds torque wrench and put it on here. And you want to get the reading as it's going around in a circle. Breakaway torque doesn't count. So if you look at the needle there, you see how the pinion's not even moving. Well, breakaway torque doesn't count. You want to get rotating where that pinion or where that uh, needle is now is what we're looking for. So right now I'm at about 24 inch pounds. So I'm just over the spec that I like. I would be within the manufacturer's spec, but I don't like to go that tight because it's easy to burn up bearings. So I'm going to add, I'm going to, I'm going to try to add two thousandths of a shim and get that thing perfect. very frustrating trying to get this dialed in and for me to get this the way I want it I know for a fact I have to be within one thousandth of an inch I was an inch a thousandth of an inch too light and I didn't have enough preload I was a thousandth of an inch the other way and I had too much preload so I'm hoping I have it dialed in now um, part of the frustrating thing with this too is, is that shims, even though they appear to all be three thousandths, five thousandths or whatever, they could be off by just a little. And sometimes that's enough to make your preload go whack. So we'll see what this does from here. <laughs> Finally at 16,000. So I'm good with that. So I'll take this apart now, get everything out of there. I have to drill my hole for the uh, bulkhead fitting. And once I do that, I'll completely clean out the housing again, and then we can put everything back together. Now we have to drill the hole for the bulkhead fitting. And if you notice here, I put the bearing cap back on so you guys can kind of get a look here. That copper line has to come up somewhere through here. You have your cleavite bushing up here and you're also gonna have your control arm that slides right over the top of this. So you don't wanna to be too far this way and you don't wanna to be too far that way because of your bearing cap. So you have to find a spot that is gonna be the happy medium between not hitting this and not hitting that. Now, each axle is gonna be slightly different, but when you're looking at it, and it was the same thing on my last axle. Let me get this here. I remember this hole here, I ended up drilling right through the back side of that, a little bit to this side of it here. And my last measurements, just to give you an idea of what you're looking for, I just put a tape measure up against kind of that, that uh, crevice right there, and it was right about an inch and a quarter. You come over to this side, and it was right at about one inch. And those are going to be rough measurements. If you're doing a low pinion housing, um, the housing is going to probably be slightly different than the high pinion. If you're doing a Dana 44, it's going to be different. So my advice to you is measure it out multiple times. Look at it. Put that bearing cap in there. See what it's going to look like and then determine where you're going to put that hole. So measure twice, cut once, as they say. Or you want your hole. I took a small center punch and put it there, but it's not big enough for me uh, for starting a drill bit. I like to get a, a good whack in there. So I'll take and I'll put a good center punch right there. Now I can take a drill. I'll take a, a smaller, maybe an eighth inch drill bit and I'll drill a pilot hole. I'll drill that all the way through and then I'll start uh, slowly um, going to bigger bit sizes so it, it cuts through all that stuff easier. Now the bulkhead fitting is going to take a, ultimately take a 7 16 drill bit. So that's what you're aiming for at the end. And then uh, you got to get it all cleaned up. The hole drilled for the bulkhead fitting and that will go right there. We still have to tap it out. So to give you an idea of where that ring gear is going to be, you can take your seal housing, get your shims and everything all set. I don't have the O-rings in there yet, and that's not necessary for what I'm trying to accomplish here. 
but you can take and put that right there. And if you look, you can see how we're missing the ring gear, but what it also does is it tells me where I can now bend that to start getting my loop going back down this way. So I'm looking at right in this area here to start that loop and I'll bend that down and then I can make the loop go up the other side and out the axle housing uh, bulkhead fitting. Anytime you need to put a, uh, a bend like this, you don't want to do that by hand because it's easy to kink a line. So take something, in this case I have my seal driver here, take that, put it in there and then start forming the line around that and that'll bend nicely around that corner without kinking your copper line. Before we move on any further, we need to get that pinion set. So I'm gonna take all those shims I had. And before I do that, I, I was gonna tell you that I completely clean that out. There's nothing in there. The last thing you wanna do is get some debris in there or shavings from your bulkhead fitting and not allow these shims to sit where they need to sit. So get that cleaned up real good. New race, make sure you wipe it down, get all that packing grease, everything off of there. You're gonna set that right about there. And you wanna get this set in as straight as you can. So when you first start, make sure it's not cockeyed. Looks like it is leaning down a little bit. So a good straight push is what we're looking for. And if it gets cockeyed, you're gonna to have to just keep working it. I tell you, it's already off a little bit. There we go. You hear that hit home, it pings pretty good. Make sure, so you heard that ding pretty good. So that race is set. I don't have to deal with that anymore. Now let's go to the other side and we need to set the seal so we can uh, then get the rest of the pinion gear in there. Okay, so we need to set the pinion now. First thing I'm gonna do is go in there wipe out any junk that might be in on that bearing race. Then I have to take the bearing and that will go in there first. But before I do that, I'm going to give it a little bit of uh, gear oil. So that way, uh, when you go to run this thing for the first time, it's not completely starved of oil. So get that in there, smear it around before it leaks out. And that will lubricate those bearings somewhat until the gear oil can get moving up on them. From there, we need our baffle pulled out of the last, uh, or pulled it out of the housing previously. So that sits in there against that. And then we need to take our seal and put our seal on. I always take and pat grease inside the seal to make sure that when the pinion pushes through, that uh, the, um, I'm sorry, not the pinion, but the yoke, when the yoke pushes through, it will be lubricated and not burn up that seal. So I take that like so, put that there. That will set your seal. From there, I'll take some grease, put it around the yoke. That way it's ready to go. I'm gonna bring the pinion through. Make sure that you have your shims on there. So if you took your shims off, make sure you put them back. And again, same thing applies here with the gear oil. I'm gonna start that right off the bat. run these bearings a little bit and get some lubrication going. So make sure you get your, your pinion set straight and you have to get this yoke through the seal. There you go. And you have to do it enough to get the nut on. Now, if you don't have a flange style nut and you throw this washer on here, it may be tough to get it started. So I always take the original, I'm sorry, my setup nut because I can get those threads started and then I'll drive it on with the impact wrench to get that pulled through. Then I'll go back through and I'll add the final nut. So let me get this going. There you go, we're getting pretty tight there now. So 
I'll take that nut off and now I'll put on the washer and the new nut. But before I do that, I want to clean up those threads. So before I move into putting the carrier in, I want to put in the inner axle seals because it's easy to work the ARB, get everything in there and you get everything set perfectly, perfectly and then you're like, yeah, and then you realize you forgot to put your seals in. Finally, time to get this carrier installed. Um, one thing I want to mention real quick is if you're working on your axle, um, a Dana 44, or anything that has bearings to the outsides of the tubes, then you're going to notice in the ARB instructions that there needs to be a slot cut down here. If you look up top side here, you can already see there's an oil drain slot that allows oil to get in there and lubricate the bearings. The problem with an ARB though is oil will get down in that slot, run out the tubes and lubricate your bearings. But when it comes back, there's nowhere for it to get back into the pumpkin. So what ARB wants you to do is to cut a slot in here, just like you have up here. And that allows oil to return, get back into the mix and then everything could still stay well lubricated. When you're dealing with a front axle though, where the seals are to the inside out pumpkin there, you don't have to worry about that step. So before I can insert the carrier, I need to get the seal housing set up. Remember the little O-rings that go with that. You need to put some gear oil on your fingers and that O-ring, smear them around real good, and then you're gonna install them into that seal housing. You gotta slowly kind of work it to get it set in there. These, these uh, O-rings are kind of square. So as you're putting them in there, you don't wanna get them twisted. And once you start getting them going, you just kind of work them, make sure there's no twist, get it in there, and then double check to make sure you have no twist. Do the same thing with the other one. Okay, now comes the uh, difficult time of trying to get this line set up, get this locker in and everything else. What I do is I take my copper line, I push it to the outside like this, because I just want to get this thing set in here first. There we go. And as I start pushing it in, and you can see we're not gonna be able to get that line up through there. So what we'll do is push it in, we'll kind of get a feel for where it needs to go, then we're gonna cut it. But this, you don't want to have turned all that way because as you insert your locker, it's gonna naturally rotate that way. If it's not where you need, you could take a punch and you can make it rotate on in the rest of the way. be real careful here as you've been dealing with it I know you've been dealing with it all day but there's nothing easy about this make sure those shims keep up nice gentle look at your carrier if you have no gap on the bottom side of the bearing but you have a gap on the top side you don't want to hit down you want to kind of Hit upwards motion just like that. So now that I'm close, I'm going to take my wood uh, um, thing here, get those straightened up, and start tapping in. You hear that one hit home? That one's home and home. So now I got to figure out this line here. As you can see, it's not going to be easy to get to, so I need to rotate this up and in first. This is one of those areas where brass punch is optimal. They look like they clear, but I'm gonna go ahead and put them in. Give you a close up here. So now the problem we have, it's not really a problem, it's just a matter of getting your line to go where you want it to go. We don't want it to rub on anything. We don't want it to rub up here. We don't want it to get caught in the ring gear. You can see there's not a whole lot of room there. But before I do anything, I have to get this line through the seal housing component. So I'm gonna kind of bend this down a little bit more. I'm gonna get a gauge of where I need to be here. And then I'm just gonna cut it and that'll allow me to tuck it under there a little bit. So. Stay tuned, I'll show you what I'm talking about.
Okay, you can cut your, your copper line with either tubing cutters, you can use a Dremel. If you're gonna use a Dremel, be careful, you don't want burrs getting back down the line. And the other thing is a Dremel will tend to cause the copper to fold over on itself. So if you do that, make sure you ream out the, the hole so that way it, it's good. And then you also want to file around the edges because this is gonna have to go, or an O-ring is gonna have to go over the top of that and we don't want to break that. So now how do we get this through here? I'm going to back up. Anything, but you really don't have much of a choice to get this to go. There you go. And then once you start getting it up here, you can fit it through the bulkhead fitting. You may have to put a little bit of a bend in it. There you go. And then once you get it to come up through the bulkhead fitting, Grab it here. See, I can bend the line now and I can make this thing straighten up now to where I need and I can get that bulkhead fitting on. So I'm gonna straighten this line up, get that bulkhead fitting in there, then we'll come back and straighten up the rest of this. With this in place, we now need to uh, install the bulkhead fitting. That is the order that those go in there. So the copper line comes up through there, you put your first O-ring on, you put the spacer on there, you put your second O-ring on there, and then this threaded uh, cap here screws down inside your bulkhead fitting and it compresses everything against that copper line and that keeps your copper line from pulling back out this way. So before we do anything, we need to get the bulkhead fitting set. You can use Teflon tape on the threads. You can use pipe dope. My preference is pipe dope. So with the copper line in there, I make sure it's inside the bulkhead fitting. I'm gonna hand tighten that for now. Then we get my wrench. And I'm gonna hold this kind of up to make sure that that line doesn't pop back out. You don't wanna over tighten that bulkhead fitting because you can break it like anything else. The first thing we need to put in there is an O-ring. And they do want you, hold on, I'm doing it right now. They do want you to put a little bit of gear oil on that O-ring to lubricate it. So when you're putting it over the copper line, it's not gonna tear. Now, one of the things when you cut that copper line, make sure that you take a file or something and round off those edges. That way, you don't have to worry about um, cutting your O-ring here. So this is one of the things you gotta be really careful with, kind of roll it on there until it goes on there. You're gonna push that one down a little bit. Then you're gonna get this spacer. The spacer goes on next. And that's gonna push down up against that O-ring. I'm gonna let that just kind of sit there for just a second. Sometimes those things can pop out because it's really tight in there. Get some oil on the other O-ring. And then we are going to roll that O-ring on. So you gotta kind of wobble it around until it, it takes. Be careful not to, to uh, get it on a jagged edge. That's one of the reasons people complain and say Airbnb's leak all the time because they didn't take their time and be patient to get this thing set right. So make sure that you take your time and do this thing right. So once you get that O-ring on there, you get the spacer on there, you get the second O-ring on there. So now with that started, push that copper line back up to it. And you're gonna notice as you tighten it, this copper line kind of gets pushed that way because that insert is pushing on it. And that's fine. So keep tightening, keep tightening, but hold pressure that way on the copper line so it doesn't pop out on you. And then when it gets to the bottom and bottoms out, those O-rings expand and they clamp around this copper line. And now, we're able, able, or now we're ready to adjust this copper line. As you can see, if I left it in here as it is, this ring gear is gonna catch it and it's gonna just tear everything up and you're gonna be uh, out of business on your ARB. So what you wanna do is start forming everything like I was talking about earlier. So there's a little cavity back there that will allow you to get that up just a little bit more than normal. And what I do next is I go around, I make sure that there's no metal touching metal. So I don't want the copper 
touching the housing. I don't want the copper touching the ring gear. I don't want the copper touching the bearing cap. And now that I have that, I'm gonna pull this away from the ring gear just a little bit. And then I want to kind of give this a curve down this way. So I'm gonna take some time to get this all set up and then we're about ready to button it up. With everything in place, you can see how the copper line kind of profiles the locker. I have probably three quarters of an inch between there. So one thing I wanna kind of look at so you can see here is you wanna make sure that that copper line does not touch anything when it comes up Make sure you have those gaps. You don't want it touching the housing. It's pretty close right there, but it's not touching the housing and that's okay. Comes down uh, where it goes out the bulkhead fitting there. It's not touching any side of that hole. It's not touching the bearing caps. It's not touching any of that stuff and that's what we want. So that way it doesn't rub and get a leak. I'm gonna check backlash. I'm going to run another pattern for final just to make sure we are solid. The last thing I need to do first is torque the bearing cap bolts and then we'll do the other. Our final backlash is about seven and a half, almost eight, which is perfect. There's our final pattern. Where's my little thing here? So what we're looking for is that thin line right up along the top side. We have good centering on the tooth. We don't have that really harsh line on the back side. Um, let's take a look at the coast side. Coast side has a good diffuse pattern. This gear job and ARB install is an absolute success. Um, the last thing I'm going to do before I put gear oil in there is I got to get the axle shafts back in. But you want to get those in there, get an airline established to that, and you want to test that before you put your gear oil in. Because if something is wrong, let's say you forgot to put your O-rings in your seal housing, then you want to make sure that uh, you don't have to take all that gear oil back out. So do that. Uh, verify that everything's good, that it locks, and that's all there is to it. That's your ARB install right there.